कल मुझको नंबर पर होगा ना और इसको दिखाना होगा आप कौन सी जुबान समझते हैं इधर देखें कितनी दफा आपसे कहोगे आप किसी तरफ देखकर बात सुने So we've talked about the part of the photon. So the part of the photon realizes a qubit. And a qubit in its general form is given by a state vector with some coefficient, which is the complex number. And along with the complex number appears the basis states. So get 0 and 1, they are materialized by the path of a photon. And then you could do logic gates, you could process the information, you could encode the information within these states, you can do interference, and so on. The other example that we've explored is the polarization of a photon. <clears throat> Let's look at the third physical realization. The spin of an electron. Now we'll have a full-fledged lecture on what is meant by the spin. Spin is a purely quantum mechanical phenomenon that cannot be explained by any classical means. Now the spin, uh, we'll have a separate lecture on spin and a few lectures on spintronics, which is the spin analog of electronics, or the spin analog of photonics. So for the time being, what I would like to mention is that if you have an electron, it has certain properties. For example, there is the mass of the electron, there is a charge on an electron. And all electrons that you can think of, they are all identical. All of them would have the same mass, and all of them would have the same charge. And all of those electrons have another property which is identical amongst all electrons, and that is called spin. Now, we we'll talked about spin, and what spin means. Spin, in English language, means rotating or revolving around a certain axis. For example, the Earth rotates around its axis. But the spin that we talk in quantum mechanics has nothing to do with rotation. It's a historical name given to a property of the electron. And how do we know that the electron has a spin? A little bit of electromagnetism here. Suppose I have an object of charge Q. And it moves around in a circuit with a speed V. Now I have a rotating charge, a revolving charge. Okay. Now if I stand here, if I have a screen here, or I have some hypothetical surface here that cuts the perimeter of this circuit, and an observer stands here, will this observer see some electric current flowing through this surface? So what is electric current? It's the rate of flow of charge. 
So now there is a charge that is moving around in a circuit, and there's an observer on the cyclical plane, and this observer would claim that there is a current in the circuit because there is a moving charge. Some charge traverses this hypothetical surface per unit time. And the amount of charge that goes around per unit time is called the current. Agree? So this moving charge constitutes a current. How much is the current? If the speed of this object is V, or this charge is V, and the radius is small r, can you calculate what the current is going to be? What should be the current? How much is the current I? Can you give a guess or can you do a rough stack of the envelope calculation? What's the current I for this charge Q? Yes. It can't be Q squared. It's Q over? No, it doesn't have a 4 pi over epsilon, not? Yes. V, Q? Excellent. It's just the charge per unit time. The time period is the distance covered 2 pi r divided by the speed. So this is the current. Agree? Now whenever you have a current flowing around in a loop, a charge goes around in a loop, does it produce a magnetic field? So if I have a charge going around in a circle, does it give you a magnetic field? Yes, it gives a magnetic field. Any moving charge produces a magnetic field. So if you have current going in a wire, it produces a magnetic field around it. So if I have a wire that is carrying some current, I, then of course a magnetic field is produced. And the direction of that magnetic field will be concentric with the axis of this current carrying wire. This will be the magnetic field direction. So a moving, any moving charge, or which is called a current, will produce a magnetic field. And if the current goes around in a circuit, it's also going to produce a magnetic field. So this moving charge is going to produce a magnetic field that is going to point outwards. Okay? So if this is a positive charge and I turn my fingers in the direction of the speed, then this moving charge will produce a magnetic field that's pointing towards you. So if I were to show the direction of this magnetic field, at the center it's going to point outwards. And I represent magnetic fields by B. Alright, so if I consider a magnet, if I draw a magnet here, a magnet also produces a magnetic field. Now this magnet, what, can you draw the uh, field from this magnet? What, what, what should it look like? Just a sketch. And then he drew magnetic fields. He sketched a magnetic field pattern. Okay? That comes out of the North Pole, goes around into the South Pole, and inside the magnet as well, it goes from the South Pole to the North Pole. So there is some directionality associated with this magnet. Agreed? 
Now, if you look at this particular configuration, now this is a magnet. I would like to call it a magnetic dipole. All right. Now, in this magnet, why dipole? Because it has two poles. One is conventionally called north, and the other is conventionally called a south pole. If I can draw this magnetic dipole by, I can read it's a vector. The magnetic dipole is a vector. It is drawn as an arrow pointing from the south to the north pole. And this arrow also points in the direction of the magnetic field, in the general sense of the magnetic field's direction. In this particular case, I have a moving charge going around in a circle, and it is producing a magnetic field that is coming outwards. So this is just looking like the tip of a magnet, and you're looking into the north pole. So just looking into this diagram is very similar to looking into this magnet from this direction. If this is your direction of observation. So this moving circulating charge acts like a magnetic dipole. And I can draw a vector for this magnetic dipole. What's going to be the direction of this dipole? It's going to point outwards. So any moving charge can, can act like a tiny magnet or a magnetic dipole. And for that moving charge, I can represent it by a vector, mu. And generally, I can write the symbol mu. Magnetic, mu, the same thing, same letter. So I can represent a magnet by a magnetic dipole. And it's a vector. It points, it has a certain directionality associated with it. If I change the direction or reverse the direction of the current here, the dipole is going to point in the opposite direction. So I can have this particular configuration, or this particular configuration, and so on. The dipole could point in any direction whatsoever. Now what does this have to do with spin or an electron? Excuse me, I know you're all busy, but this is important as well. Now what does this have to do with the spin and what what does this, how does this correlate with quantum computing and a qubit? Now if I have if I have a magnet and I pass it through a magnetic field, what's going to happen? That's the question. But before that, I would like to find out if this is my current. How strong is this magnet? All right? Now it's intuitive that stronger the charge, bigger the charge, bigger will be the magnetic dipole strength. Stronger, higher the speed, the bigger should be the magnetic dipole moment. All right? So, and what if I make this radius larger? So instead of having a loop that is smaller, I have a bigger loop. <coughs> the same amount of charge goes around in a bigger loop. What will that, if, what, how will that affect the magnetic dipole strength? Okay? It's going to increase. So, there is a formula that you study in electricity and magnetism which relates the magnetic dipole strength with the amount of current, I, and the area enclosed by the circulating charge, which is pi r squared. So this is the formula for the strength of the magnetic dipole moment. And the units, of course, are turning out to be amperes meter squared. So this tells you how strong the magnet is. The strength of the magnet, or the dipole. Now let's find mu for this circulating charge. Yes. The dipole moment increases, yes. No. Bigger the area, 
bigger will be the dipole side, the strength of this magnet. Okay, and this is the relationship. Now, I would like to find out something quite interesting. If I take this mu, and I take this current, I take this current here, I write Q, G, pi r squared, divided by 2 pi r. This pi goes away, this r goes away, and I'm left with Q over 2 vr. Magnetic dipole mode. Now if you put an M here, which is the mass of this particle, if this is a massive particle, and I need to divide by M as well. Now what is MVR? This is the angular momentum of this moving, circulating charge, massive particle. So I have a relationship between the magnetic dipole moment and the angular momentum. I write L for the angular momentum. Now the angular momentum is a vector. So is mu. So I can put a vector sign on top of this. I can put a vector sign on top of this. Now this is an important relationship for an electron. Consider this now to be an electron inside an orbit in an atom, for example. We've, all, all, we've already seen the Bohr's model, although there are inconsistencies inside the Bohr model. It does not corroborate well with the uncertainty principle. But for, a time, for the time being, let's consider that the Bohr's model is correct. An electron is going around the nucleus with a certain speed. There's a certain radius. There are These electrons are inside Bohr's radius. So each electron carries an angular momentum. Okay? Now this is due to the orbital motion of the electron. The electron is going around, revolving around the nucleus. So this kind of angular momentum is called the orbital angular momentum. And this is the magnetic moment. Now the angular momentum is a mechanical quantity. Right? It's mechanical. And this is magnetic. So now there is a relationship between a mechanical quantity and a magnetic quantity. Agreed? And Q over 2m is just a constant for the electron. The charge on the electron is constant and the mass of the electron is constant. If you had an electron, this Q becomes negative. So the angular and the momentum and the magnetic moment point in the opposite direction. So a moving charge electron has a magnetic moment and there is a relationship between the magnetic moment and the orbital angular momentum. Now this angular momentum we know is already quantized. This is m h bar for an electron where m is a number that goes from 1, 2, 3 and so on. So this means that this object is also going to be quantized. Mu, the magnetic moment, is quantized. <coughs> now the question is, we know the we know the Bohr's model and we know You've already taken a course in chemistry. You know that the electron inside an atom can exist in different orbits. Alright? And within an orbit, there are orbitals. And you have S orbital, P orbital, D orbital, F orbital, and so on. So how are these orbitals different? So if an electron exists in the S orbital, how it's different from an electron in the p orbital. It's not different, these are identical electrons, but it's going to have a different property. What is that property that differentiates an s orbital from an p orbital? Shape. The shape of the wave function. Spin. Energy. Energies are different. What else? 
probability density, the shape of that cloud becomes different. This looks like a shell. This looks like a dumbbell. This has more complicated shapes, right? So this, these are pictures of probability density functions of the modulus squared of the wave function. But there is one property which is different, and that is L. The orbital angular momentum is different. In the S orbital, this L, which is given by a quantum number L, small l, L plus 1, h bar, this small l is 0. Right? You've already studied this in Gen 101. This is 1 here. This is 2 here. This is 3 here. I hope you've taken this, this much atomic structure in Chem 101. All right. So what is different in these orbitals are the angular momentum, L. All right. Orbital angular momentum. So if an electron exists in the L equals 0 state, then what should be its magnetic moment? Mu should be 0, because this is 0. So if a particle doesn't have orbital angular momentum, its magnetic moment is 0. It is magnetically silent. It does not act like a magnet. However, when an experiment was performed for the first time in 1932 by Stern and Gertner, they observed something quite interesting. How can you tell? You have a particle. How can you tell whether it has a magnetic moment? Can you perform an experiment that can distinguish a particle based upon its magnetic moment? How can you tell? So I have a stream of particles coming in, and I would like to find out whether these particles have a magnetic moment, whether they act like dipoles or not. What kind of experiment would you like to perform? How can you tell? Somewhere from the back, please. Yes. Yes. Very good. Was that your answer? Was that your answer too? So you will apply a magnetic field. <laughs> magnetic moments respond to magnetic fields. You have a magnet, you place it inside a magnetic field, it's going to change its orientation, perhaps. So we, we are physicists, we're trying to become physicists, so let's try to mathematicize this statement a little bit. What kind of force acts on a magnetic moment? Now, if I have a magnetic field pointing in the upward direction, and I represent this field by B, okay, it's a vector. If I have my magnetic moment parallel to this field, this is one possibility. I can also have my magnetic moment anti-parallel to the field. Which one of these configurations is energetically favorable? Energetically favorable means which one of these has a low energy? This one, of course, has a low energy. A magnet tends to align itself with an external magnetic field. Okay. So if this is B, I, you can consider that this B is being produced by a giant magnet which has a north pole here and a south pole here, a giant magnet. And this tiny magnet, this dipole, effectively, uh, pictorially, is like a tiny magnet which has a south pole here and a north pole here because this stands for this direction. And this is what's going to happen. The south pole is going to point in the direction of the north pole. So this configuration is favorable. Nature would like to go into states that have a lower energy. This is a high energy state. All right? So what's going to happen is 
that if I put a dipole inside this magnetic field, it will tend to align itself in the direction of the magnetic field. So that means energy is lowered. A torque acts on it. Now, if I would like to write down the energy, if I would like to write the formula for the energy of a dipole inside a magnetic field, this is potential energy because it has nothing to do with motion. It just depends upon the configuration of the dipole inside the magnetic field. What kind of formula should I come up with that incorporates this vector and this vector and tells me what the potential energy of this dipole is going to be? What kind of mathematical operation do I need to do on mu and b and put it inside the energy? Energy, by the way, is a scalar. And this is a vector. This is a vector. Cross product? No, dot product. So I will need to take the dot product of two vectors so that I can compose a scalar product. So if I take the dot product mu, dot it with b. Is this equal to energy? Is this correct? And does it correspond to our mental picture over here? So this has an angle in it. But is this correct? When mu and b are parallel, is the energy higher or lower? Should it be higher or lower? Should be lower. But does this reflect this scenario? No. What should I do then to this formula? If I would like this formula to correspond to physical reality, what should I do to it? I should just put in, very good, just put a negative sign in here. <laughs> so this is the energy of a dipole inside a magnetic field. Now, there is a force that acts on this. Already, what you see is, there is going to be a force that acts on this dipole. And if I know the potential energy, can I find out forces? Yes. So I just take F. This is going to be minus the gradient of the energy. But of course, you're going to be frightened with the symbol. So I do something simple here. You find out a force from a potential energy in the following fashion. The x component of the force is minus the derivative with respect to the x component of the energy, which is mu dotted with b. The y component of the force is going to be the negative of the derivative of the energy with respect to the y direction. And the z component of the force is given by this expression. So now in order to have a force act on the particle, so if a beam of, so the question which that the key answer was that if I have a beam of particles coming in and I would like to find out whether they have a magnetic moment, I would like to see how they deflect inside magnetic fields. Whether they go up, whether they go down, or whether they go straight ahead without changing their course of motion. So I would like to have a force act on these particles in order to differentiate their views. If they have a magnetic moment, they will deflect somehow. Which means I would like to find out if a force acts on these moments. Now by looking at these expressions, what do I need to have a force act on these particles? Mu is a constant. All right, Mu is just a constant. It depends upon the angular momentum, the charge on electron, mass on electron. I need to have, what's the, what's the prerequisite for a force? I need a magnetic field. Is that all? 
If I have a magnetic field which is nice and uniform, it's the same everywhere. Will there be a force on a magnetic dipole? No. Because of these derivatives, I need change in B with respect to X. I need the magnetic field to change with X. Or I need the magnetic field to change with Y. Because this is a constant. Or I need the magnetic field to change with Z. So I must have some change in the magnetic field. I need to have a gradient or a variation in B. So my magnetic field needs to be non-uniform. It has to be varying in space. I cannot have a uniform magnetic field and expect that the force acts on a magnetic moment. I need to have a variable field. Now, <clears throat> so the condition is I need field gradients. By the way, one question. If I have a uniform field, will a force act on a dipole? No, it should not act on the dipole. But I have already claimed that if I put this magnetic dipole at an arbitrary orientation, it twists in the direction and tries to become parallel to the field. Doesn't that negate my earlier statement that there should be no force acting on this dipole? Don't speak up so that everyone can participate. Excuse me, can you answer my question please? Yes, the lady at the back, yes. Ji, you have time. You have to look at the screen. Can you answer my question? What question? Yes, that's, that's why I asked you. You don't know, even know what the question is. So the question is that if I put a dipole at an arbitrary orientation, it's going to twist in the direction of the field so that it lowers its energy. That's the favorable scenario. But I've already said that no force should act on this dipole because the field is the same everywhere. How do I reconcile these statements? No external force? No. No, it's not changing. It's uniform. Yes. The force is zero. Actually, if I have a dipole and it just twists and its center of mass doesn't change its position, the force is still zero. The torque can be non-zero, by the way. So this twisting is done by a torque. There's an upper, there's a force that is acting in the upper direction here and a force in the downward direction in this, on this end. And this torque twists the dipole. But the force acting on this dipole is still zero. So there can be torques without net forces. Anyway, so now if I would like to find out whether I have a non-zero magnetic moment, I just need to pass my beam of particles through a field gradient. Now let's do, let's try to come up with an experiment. So I have a north pole here and a south pole here of a big magnet and I shape these pole pieces. They're not uniform. I shape them in a certain way that I machine them normal pole pieces and I shape them. I make a cone out of this and I make a concave shape out of this pole piece so that the magnetic field lines, they are bunched to tighter here in this region like this. So now if I look at this diagram, these field lines don't intersect. They 
are further apart near the North Pole and bunched together near the South Pole. So there are more field lines per unit area near the South Pole. So the field is stronger here in this region and it's weaker in this region. So there is a field gradient. The field is stronger here and the field is weaker here. And as you go from the North Pole to the South Pole, the field strength decreases. Suppose this is my Z direction. So now I have a field that is changing with Z. All right? Suppose the field has three components, X, Y, and Z. So this field can be, have an X component, right? You know the unit vectors. It can have a Y component, and it can have a Z component. And I suppose that in this experiment, the field only has a Z component. It does not have an X or a Y component. So the field only has a Z component. It's just vertically upwards. But it's stronger here at the bottom and weaker at the top. So this is an assumption that I'm making. It is not physically achievable, but let's, for simplicity's sake, let's assume this. So this is zero, this is zero. Now if I look at this expression, only this force is going to be non-zero because the derivative with respect to x is zero. There's no change along the x direction. <coughs> and there is no change along the y direction. There's only a change along the z direction. <coughs> so this force, F, is going to point in the z direction, is going to be equal to minus d by dz of this scalar product, which is mu z component, dz. Because mu has a z component, x component, y component. And when you take the dot product with b, b only has a z component, so mu z, b z survives. So my f z becomes minus mu z is a constant. The derivative of b z respect to z. So this is the force that acts on a particle. <laughs> if there is a gradient around the b direction, and if a force acts on the particle, you can tell that there is some non-zero magnetic moment. Now when this experiment was originally performed in 1932 by atoms that exist in the s orbital, in the ground state, what happened is, you have this non-uniform field. You have an oven, which is raised to a high temperature. And inside this oven, silver atoms are present. They increase their energy. They come out of the slit, and they form a beam, atomic beam and they move along this path inside the non-uniform field. And on the other end, there is a screen. So what Stern and Gerlach observed in 1932, just out of mere luck, because of a bad mistake, basically, the suit of a cigar which actually developed this film and they observed that there are two distinct spots on this <coughs> screen which means that the beam of particles which are silver atoms each one of them had an orbital angular momentum L equals zero therefore technically they should not have a magnetic moment because L is zero, 
this beam of atoms actually diverged into two directions. So one of them went up, one of them went down, and produced two distinct spots on a screen, which actually states that this music can take up two values, a positive value and a negative value. Because for a positive value, this thing is negative, the force is, say, in one direction. For a positive or a negative value, the force is still the same, but it takes the opposite sign. So the force can be positive or negative. So this experimental result shows that music takes up two values. Two values. Music can be sum plus, say, mu or minus mu. All right? And it can only take up two values. Just two values. You do not see, you do not see something like this. You do not see a smear of electrons. So mu becomes quantized. But where is this mu coming from? Because L is zero. If this L is zero, the magnetic moment is zero. But these silver atoms, even though their L is zero, they are behaving like tiny magnets. They are behaving like magnetic dipoles because they are deflected by an inhomogeneous field. So the conjecture was, this is how the spin was discovered. The this, this spin was theoretically predicted by Dirac, and this experiment showed the existence of spin, and the idea was that in addition to L, there is some angular momentum of the electron or a particle, which is denoted by S, which is also an angular momentum. It has the same units as L, but it's not an orbital angular momentum. It has nothing to do with the orbital motion of the electron, but it's a property of the electron or the atom. And it was given the name spin. And the spin gives rise to a magnetic moment exactly in the same fashion here. And there is another Q over 2m here which is the charge and the mass of the particle. But there is an additional factor, G, which accounts for which kind of particle you're talking about. This is called the Landé G factor. This object is called, Q over 2M is called the gyromagnetic ratio. So this experiment actually predicts the existence of a spin over and above the orbital angular momentum. All right? So if an object has both orbital angular momentum as well as spin, both of these factors contribute to the magnetic moment. So if an object has orbital angular momentum, as well as spin, both of these factors give rise to a magnetic moment. Both of them come with Q over 2m, L plus a factor of G. Both of these factors give rise to a magnetic moment. If L equals 0, then we have the magnetic moment purely due to the spin. G Q over 2 M S. Now this spin is quantized. Okay? 
that's what the experiment is actually showing us, which means that mu is quantized. Since mu is quantized, we know that spin is quantized. The experiment is giving us some clue about what the magnetic moment should be. That's what the experiment is telling us. Because the force depends upon the magnetic moment. So if this is quantized, the force is quantized because you have two distinct spots, this must be quantized. If this is quantized, mu is quantized, then S is quantized. If I take the Z component of both sides, mu Z is G, Q over 2 M, S Z. So if this is quantized, if this takes up two values, plus mu and minus mu, this means that this takes up two values. Alright? Now, what we have here is the spin of an electron which is only taking up two possible values. This is a qubit. A two-level quantum system is a qubit. The spin of an electron is a materialization, one possible materialization of a qubit. Let's use the spin of an electron to do quantum computing. So that's another physical realization of a qubit. So instead of using the path of a photon or the polarization of a photon, we can also use the spin of an electron to do quantum computing. That's also a valid candidate for a qubit. Okay, so I'll show later that this SG actually takes up two possible values. We know that L is quantized and H bar. N takes up the values 1, 2, 3 and so on. Where do you get this from? You get this from the Schrodinger equation, which we learn about next week. But Sz is also quantized. For an electron, it can take up two possible values. Plus h bar by 2 and minus h bar by 2. This 1 over 2 half is the spin of an electron. So an electron is a spin half particle. For an electron, this G equals approximately equals 2, the value of G. So mu Z for an electron is Q over M H bar half plus minus. So mu is quantized. It's plus minus Q over 2M into H bar. So you have two possibilities of mu, mu z, and these two possibilities act like states get 0 and get 1. If this is the magnetic moment of an electron, mu z is pointing in this direction parallel to the magnetic field, you call this configuration ket0. And if the field is pointing upwards but the magnetic moment is pointing downwards, you call this configuration ket1. So these become the two basis states for your quantum computer. You can also use the spin of an electron in other words. Now let's take a 10 minute break and in this 10 minute let's reconvene for the quiz, let's settle down. So a break really means a settling down for the quiz, alright?